Uh, I remember being asked frequently when I was an undergraduate student at BYU why I was studying philosophy. I was studying philosophy and politics. And uh, so many well-meaning friends would say, uh, you have a testimony, we have the gospel. Why would you need philosophy? That's, uh, I mean, philosophers have been uh, batting these questions back and forth for uh, millennia. They don't seem to have gotten anywhere, but we have revelation, so why would we need uh, philosophy? I came up with an answer for my friends that I still think serves some purpose, and that is, uh, I grant you we have the answers. I, I believe it. I believe in them. I cherish them. But until we know the questions, we don't know what the answers mean. And uh, I think in studying uh, philosophical traditions and other religious traditions, we find out all kinds of questions that otherwise we wouldn't know how to articulate. But there's something irreducible that, that, can, that cannot be explained, and that is the, the possibility of knowledge itself that points to some sort of uh, cosmic yoking, some order of meaning in which the knower and the known are made for each other. Uh, one day I was literally on the way to my political philosophy class where I had to talk about these things, and it's, uh, it's a big challenge, you know, trying to to convey the depth and the beauty of an idea like that. And I, I was trying to think, uh, how possibly could I, I've done it for 25 years or more, but still I'm trying to think of how I can possibly find a way to connect the students with this. And uh, a primary song came to my mind uh, quite spontaneously, miraculously or not, but it came, and it was whenever I hear the song of a bird. Uh, I wish I could re remember all the words right now. Or look at the clear blue sky. Uh, there's a miracle of creation that is immediately accessible if it's not suppressed by technical, instrumental explanations of knowledge. Uh, the second verse goes, He gave me my eyes that I might see, my ears that I might hear. Uh, so there's, there's, there's something of a gift in the very possibility of knowing. Well, there's an example of my encounter with uh, just a, um, a pivotal moment in, in Platonic philosophy. I, by the way, I think it's a moment that resonates uh, throughout the West with that conception of a cosmic ground of knowledge and the opposition to it, which is in a way definitive of a modern technological approach. Well, I, to, to me, the meaning is there in the link between the primary song and the uh, you know, platonic moment, which is taken to be arcane and technical. But really, it's the most primitive, basic, elementary thing that is the most beautiful, that has the greatest depths. Uh, another philosopher I study likes to say that the... Uh, the depths are, in a way, always on the surface. You know? um, and that connects for me with the gospel idea of mysteries. We often, among Latter-day Saints, use the term mystery negatively as something that obscure interest religions might want to use uh, to detract from the plain and simple truths of the gospel. But no, mysteries is used in a positive light in the Book of Mormon and other scriptures. And uh, to me, the mystery is always uh, mystery. Uh, I mean, may be of interest to speculate about uh, Kolob or some, you know, cosmic question of the big picture. Uh, I can respect that, but in a way, the great mystery is always on the surface. What does it mean to repent? How does the atonement make it possible for us to repent? How is our agency bound up with atonement? Uh, and these are the kinds of uh, questions that philosophical and religious traditions can help us learn to ask. They can um, 
sort of uh, give us some leverage from a new angle to understand how to open up, open up a text from another direction. The pluralism, yeah, where, where foundations are in dispute, I guess my view, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem, and I don't know where, where we're heading, and in a way we're in un, uncharted territory. I don't, uh, I think there's altogether too much complacency about what's called the fact of pluralism. Charles Taylor and others, uh, John Rawls likes to refer to the fact of pluralism. It's not quite a fact, it's a problem it's a challenge. It may be a possibility, but I think we're a little naive and complacent about it because all political society rests upon authoritative norms. Unless, I mean, the other option is uh, sheer force or the, you know, the, the intimidation of coercion. Uh, either people consent to a law and to a legal political order more generally uh, from some place in their hearts and minds on, on the basis of some uh, more or less implicit principle that fits within an order of goods that they that is theirs. Either they assent to it from some principle within their own souls, or else it's a sheer matter of coercion and necessity. So uh, order may be possible without any principled assent, but it certainly wouldn't be democratic. It wouldn't be self-government. It would be despotic in one form or another. Uh, so the term pluralism is often an excuse for not thinking about what will be the principle upon which we assent. Because what's excluded is a meaningful discussion about human purposes. And you can never have true freedom, moral agency, self-government, without a deliberate reflection on human purposes, without intelligence. As a Latter-day Saint, Ralph, have you if someone were to throw a football at you right now and say, when, when you catch this, you need to tell me the answer to this question <laughs> right now, and that is, what is the ultimate purpose? What is the ultimate purpose for human beings? How would you answer that question? If, they, if you had to prioritize all, all penultimate purposes and say, is there an ultimate purpose, how would you answer that question? <laughs> Is that all you want to know? That's all I want to know. <laughs> you just told me that it's a teleological world in which the soul lives, mm -hmm. or it isn't really alive. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm well, thinking, so I, this can be uh, cut out. Uh, yeah, I'm I think for whether you think the purpose is literally seeking that purpose. That would be a kind of purpose. that would be a kind of Socratic answer. Yeah. yeah. Or is there a purpose that the good that we come to? I find in when I'm reading symposium. That he does not name the good. Yeah. Just, just so, uh, is there an ultimate purpose that is determinant in any way, knowable that we can, you know, shake a stick at or put our finger yeah, on? It would bring us all together. And, and so to speak. in a in a way, um, in a way, either answer that you give leads to a dead end, doesn't it, or leads to a kind of nihilism? Because if you say either. There is no purpose. That's kind of a Hobbesian position. It's uh, just one darn thing after another. <laughs> it's just what we call purpose is just the activity of, uh, you know, being led by one appetite and then another. And there's there's no end. Uh, a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Right. Uh, that seems to lead to nihilism. On the other hand. As soon as you define the purpose and put it in a box and think that you can capture it, then this is a little more subtle, but uh, that doesn't seem to be quite right either, because something about our purposiveness seems to be, seems to have to do with a surplus, with an excess, with a gift, with something that always exceeds what can be 
contained in any given moment. So. I hope you got that. I hope you got I, that. I got it really cool going back and forth yeah. on the, each side of you. So That was a pretty eloquent statement. Yeah. So. Uh, for, for dodging the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had to, I had to, get, so I had to cheer. I get think, back into I, th I think there, I mean, I mean, there is language that we can use to help to uh, evoke and make available to us to remind us of experiences of purposiveness, of goodness. But surely the language can never say the final word on this or capture it completely, or else we would finish talking about it. Here's the beautiful thing. Moses chapter 1, twice I think there's a reference to there's no end to my works or neither to my words. And those two things go together. So the infinite fecundity of works has to be accompanied by the infinite fecundity of words. The thinking about, um, thinking about the um, appreciating verbally with ever more exquisite refinement the goodness of the fecundity of beings is inexhaustible. And so to me that has always been very meaningful of the, how the, uh, the infinity of works and of words must go together. Um, the atonement isn't what, isn't simply what makes agency possible. Atonement is interior to the meaning of agency. The atonement makes it possible to choose meaningfully and freely because it calls upon us to be like Christ and to be willing to give up on the projects over which we have absolute control, to sacrifice our rational power, you might say, in order to receive something infinitely larger, in order to gain our own soul and to gain eternal lives. That reminds me of an interreligious experience. I don't know if it fits your categories exactly, but Go for it. I'll tell, I'll tell you about it anyway, because uh, uh, I mentioned I'd soon be going to my 40th reunion. I think it was at my 30th reunion that I met, uh, I got together again with someone I had known in high school, a fairly familiar acquaintance, but not somebody who was in my cool crowd or, you know, us guys, but somebody we joked with who as kind of an outsider. Uh, he since uh, he since became very serious about his Judaism. I think he became a rabbi. Uh, I had hardly talked with him for 30 years. And he told me at our 30th reunion, three decades later, that he had been bearing these scars from how me and my friends had treated him. Isn't that sad? Isn't it sad that we didn't have an opportunity to repent and forgive <laughs> at our 10th reunion, at least? Uh, but I was happy that, that we had it. And it, it, did, it reminds me of, uh, now I wouldn't have guessed that. I believe him entirely that we were mean and cruel. But I wouldn't have known it if he hadn't told me. How many of these scars have we left all over the place? How many scars are there on us? You know, some that we have access to and some that we don't. Uh, and what a sweet liberation it is to be, to be reconciled, to be able to, uh, to see past these things. Yeah, well, we don't need to 
agree on everything, but we do need, I think we're in, in increasingly desperate need of agreeing on something, on something besides the fact that we are material beings with material needs and uh, our rights based upon these needs or, a, or on some uh, sub-rational sub need for self-expression. All that we've agreed on, but we need we'll soon need something more substantive than that. And of course, it's not going to be, we're not all going to uh, uh, subscribe to a definite set of religious dogmas, uh, Christian or whatever. But that doesn't mean that we cannot uh, reason together and find common ground. It won't always be reducible to neat propositions. But I think it's increasingly urgent that we recognize together human goods that transcend our material circumstances. Uh, we are material beings, and, uh, and uh, it's right and necessary, and there's even a Christian dimension to our uh, attention to the material needs of our, of, of our brothers and sisters. But um, we will not much longer be able to, how shall I say, to pursue and defend human rights if we can't share the slightest notion of what a human being is. How can we defend our humanity when it's a pure uh, cipher, uh, like a, a bracketed uh, nothing? We will need to be able to share some common sense of our humanity, which is to be, is to be defended. This uh, comes to view very immediately in the realm of, of, of biotechnology. Uh, you know, C.S. Lewis's warning, it'd be 50, no, 60 or more years ago now, abolition the abolition of man, his, his warning that our mastery over nature if it's not restrained by some, uh, some idea of humanity with a transcendent dimension, then our mastery over nature can only become the empire of man over man. And it would be, it will be, it is increasingly uh, a blind empire, a blind rush to manipulate the material of our humanity without knowing what makes a human life good and truly human. We engineer, we re-engineer humanity because we can, but toward what end, what, for what purpose? It seems to me that all the great religions have an urgent interest in communing with each other on the need to think and defend our humanity. There's a definite Mormon theological strain that uh, seems to open up in that direction. And I've talked to young Latter-day Saints recently who uh, are completely enthusiastic about Mormons jumping into the bioengineering science and business with both hands because isn't this uh, like becoming godlike? Why wait? But that's divorcing the power from the consecration, from the sacrifice, from the atonement. It strikes me as kind of a parallel argument with the question of, of communism. You know, isn't the United Order kind of like communism because it's not exactly capitalism, I suppose. Well, <laughs> if you say it, it's like, uh, uh, it's like communism except, I mean, communism is like the United Order but without like the consecration, without obedience, without the soul, without the main thing, therefore, without everything, without the, the governing principle that would make us worthy to have this kind of power. So I see um, the technological impulse as a kind of uh, frightening doppelganger, you know, to the promise of a sanctified divinity, 
to think that we're worthy to yield whatever power we can lay our hands on because we can is a very, to me, opposite sensibility from consecrating and sacrificing ourselves and uh, putting our own wills on the altar in order to be worthy to participate in a, if you want to call it a divine technology, then I won't necessarily object, but don't forget about the divine part. Yes, I, I tried in my talk at the conference to yeah. make that distinction between the city of Enoch yeah. and the tower of the city of Babel. Yeah, perfect, yeah. You know, that technologically we can get up there, yeah. so let's do it. And yet God said, you, you, you have your eye on the wrong thing. I'm trying to change your heart. Yeah. It's not not do cosmetic sense yeah, surgery. I've run, into, I've run into this very observant young Mormon who's uh, actually studying uh, neuroscience or something and and artificial intelligence and he just uh, he thinks of it as in perfect perfect continuity with the divinization promises of uh, uh, of Mormonism and so forth. But uh, I think it's very problematic. I think uh, take things in order, <laughs> um, uh, don't assume that you're um, competent or worthy to wield powers that uh, haven't been given. You are uh, emphasizing that uh, kind of uh, deep friendship that makes it possible to not to not to renounce, but to bracket our convictions in order to let them be tested and explored by seeing with the eyes of friends who come from other traditions and so forth, and that's extremely valuable. Uh, one point I was trying to make today is that a danger inherent in this is uh, in this uh, higher level openness to diversity. Uh, the danger is always of slipping into an ideology of diversity, which I believe is a sham ideology, because it always assumes in advance that what we have in common in human beings is uh, what science can account for, and that we always want to be freer and freer from any restraints. So I think the political moment in this reflection is essential to guard against that degradation of your uh, higher ideal. And at the same time, the uh, cultiva cultivation of uh, political wisdom by understanding, I would say in a way, the goods of pluralism and the limitations of pluralism uh, is essential to preserving, recreating an environment in which your higher friendship, your uh, con contestation, uh, respectful your res an environment in which your respectful contestation can happen. <laughs>